we are going to look at about 30 minutes of presentation between Isuru and Eric. Uh, they do a little self-introduction. After their presentations, uh, we want to open it up to a discussion. Um, it would be great if you could send your uh, questions uh, to me or everyone into the chat. Um, please indicate whether you would like to present your question yourself personally, then I can call on you uh, and you can present the question yourself, or I will just read it out uh, myself. I will just schedule it in a way that makes sense. Um, after at about one o'clock, uh, we'll make a time check. Um, the meeting might go longer. Uh, you can stick around, but um, uh, we, we're respectful of everyone, of course, who wants to leave then, um, and we look to, to get kind of to kind of closure at one o'clock. Um, so uh, let's have it first with Isuru. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> my name is Isuru Sen. Uh, I'm in Queens, New York. Um, so I'm an energy and climate uh, professional uh, for about two decades. Uh, so I do technology, sustainable business development, and uh, yeah. There's hundreds of events. Um, so I'm currently studying for a master's in sustainability at Howard Extension. And basically what drives me is, you know, I have two small children. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how to uh, kind of effectively decarbonize while ensuring uh, a quality of life for most people. Uh, so uh, let's jump in. So uh, today we're talking about the role of nuclear in a carbon-free future. And this is the backdrop, right? So um, the global energy consumption by source. So you can see um, we, we burn a lot of wood and then coal, oil, gas, and the other sources we speak about here. Um, as we switch or switch on more higher quality sources of energy, it's not that we let go of our lower quality sources. So traditional biomass, which is basically burning things for heat, uh, we use more of it today than we did in 1800. So, um, and the same for coal, oil, and gas. So while we speak about an energy transition, at this point, it's largely um, aspirational, or uh, there's a lot, lot of work to be done. Uh, another way to look at this is the fossil share of our energy mix. Um, <clears throat> it was 86% in 2001. And uh, two decades later, uh, with the massive investments in uh, solar and wind and other technologies, uh, we are at 82%. So we haven't really done too much. And, and the total mix, uh, total amount has increased during this time. So um, emissions are high. So we need a better approach. Um, a holistic approach as we argue here. So this is a, where the emissions are coming from today. Uh, I know it's a busy slide, but if you look at energy itself, it's only three quarters of emissions, uh, ag, forest, uh, cement, etc. cetera, uh, land use change uh, uh, are the rest of it. So even within the energy component, a uh, quarter of the emissions are from industry, um, and then about one sixth of it comes from buildings. And some of the, this is electricity, so appliances, uh, lights, and so on. But uh, there's a ton of uh, heat uh, uses uh, that come with it, especially in industry uh, as we look a little closer. So um, what if we decarbonize electricity and solar and wind are helping decarbonize electricity at this uh, presently? Um, but quarter of, only a quarter of emissions come from electricity. So the question is, how do we effectively decarbonize other sectors, both efficiently and sustainably? Uh, so this is when we get into kind of the industry component a little, uh, and that is the heat need. So if you look at some of these um, uh, industrial energy users here, you see that um, you need a high, very high heat for things like glass and cement ma manufacturing, uh, steel making, steam electrolysis. These are all very high temperature heat requirements. Um, and you can generate this heat with, uh, with electricity uh, by converting it into heat. 
But every time you do a phase change, either from electricity to heat or from say, um, you make hydrogen out of electricity, you, you lose uh, 30, 40, it depends. Uh, you lose a big chunk of the energy embedded. So it's a very lossy way to generate uh, this level of high heat using electricity. So uh, in comes um, cogeneration. So cogeneration is you use the same facility to generate both electricity and heat. And if we can do that, we can decarbonize some of these higher emissions, uh, um, higher heat needs while uh, not having emissions if you, if you can do it with uh, low carbon sources. So uh, this is where uh, we see nuclear as an, uh, one edge ability to do this. Our existing nuclear capacities can generate enough heat for um, district heating, sorry, uh, district heating and seawater desalination, which is becoming more important as uh, parts of the world become uh, parched. And then developing reactors are capable of providing most of the, um, even the high temperature heat requirements uh, that we need. Uh, and uh, new technologies will add to the slew of options available to um, make that happen. So for the most, for most industrial heat applications, nuclear is the only credible non-carbon option. So we can't just uh, ignore these pieces of the puzzle to decarbonize. And this is not new. Uh, 80 reactors around the world uh, are currently produce um, desalination, district heating or uh, processing. So district heating is like uh, building decarbonization, key yielding decarbonization technology, which we'll hear more about as we go. Um, and this is a study that uh, came out uh, last year from MIT Stanford. California's Diablo Canyon nuclear plant can provide desalinated water uh, and then generate hydrogen at half the cost of doing so with solar and wind. So let's coming back to the electricity, uh, electricity side of the story. Uh, just want to show you this small clip. I can put it on full screen. Énergie renouvelable était seule. Son amour était intermittent. Seulement quand le soleil brillait, le vent soufflait. Elle avait besoin de quelqu'un de fiable, prévisible, dont l'amour était constant. Elle rencontra gaz naturel. Comme elle, il était propre et il était bon marché. Il dit :« Que veux-tu » Elle dit. Je veux quelqu'un de constant. Il dit, je peux t'aimer quand le soleil se réfugie derrière les nuages et que le vent arrête de souffler. Elle demanda, seras-tu toujours là dans les prochaines années à venir Il dit, oui. Elle demanda, combien d'années Il dit, Until the sun. plus longtemps que tu ne crois. Énergie renouvelable était heureuse et plus seule. Ensemble, énergie renouvelable et gaz naturel formèrent une belle relation. you like that? Um, so is this true? I mean, this is an ad, right? This is an ad from Shell marketing gas. And it is true get that gas uh, has reduced emissions uh, by uh, displacing coal. But is it true that um, renewable energy requires this gas backup, this beautiful relationship? <clears throat> so let's look at um, energy generation on demand, right? Like we want the lights to come on when you turn the switch on, not uh, different times. So um, when you have intermittent generation, that's uh, solar and wind, uh, then either you need a large amount of storage for when uh, that those sources are not producing, and that's uh, going to get extremely expensive as we're going to talk about a bit more later, uh, and or interconnections, so transmission lines to get the energy to where it's produced from, it's produced to where it's needed, 
transmission lines are one of the hardest infrastructure projects to, uh, to projects to permit uh, in the West, especially US, uh, and or backup, backup base load. So you still have to maintain your high carbon energy sources as backup. Uh, so there's a maintenance cost to it, or you have uh, the um, low carbon sources as well. And, or you have to beg your customers to not use uh, as much energy. So then um, the question is, uh, or you can provide all this energy with the low carbon um, sources. So if you look at the system costs of generating electricity, this is the grid level costs um, only. Uh, so that the production facility itself is one portion of it. The other components we just talked about uh, add a lot to the cost. And then beyond that, there's a kind of environmental costs of the metals, the mining, the uh, land use and such. Uh, Eric will talk a little more about this in the, in the next piece. <clears throat> so this is a bit of a tricky chart, but uh, it's a 3D map of cost of uh, system cost of um, electricity generation. Um, so when you go from say 400 grams per kilowatt hour, which is a medium uh, polluting grid to uh, one or zero uh, emissions, uh, your uh, costs does go up, but in a nuclear solar plus wind world, uh, it doesn't increase too much. But if you arbitrarily limit your inner technology choices to solar and wind alone, the, uh, you know, after a certain level, it becomes exponentially expensive uh, to society. So this is not good. Um, so how does this play out in the real world? So here's a tale of two neighbors, uh, France versus Germany. Uh, France decarbonizes it, decarbonize its electric grid in the, 70, uh, in the 80s, uh, largely uh, through a nuclear buildup. So 70% of the uh, electricity is uh, nuclear and then about a quarter is renewable. And this is the emissions intensity. So I, I recommend everybody to go check out this website called electricitymap.org, which shows uh, a kind of a minute by minute breakdown of where emissions, uh, what the emissions intensity of electric grids and where who's providing electricity to their neighbors and so on. Uh, so Germany, on the other hand, um, has pursued a 100% renewable plan and is shutting down its nuclear plants. And its emissions intensity is multiples that of France. And its electricity price uh, is twice as that of plants until the recent um, uh, energy crisis has pushed all of Europe into disarray. Um, and uh, this is after Germany spent, uh, has allocated half a trillion euros to its uh, renewables program. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, um, yeah, so that's a uh, indication of what's to come if we pursue uh, Germany only uh, like policy. So um, summing this up, like electricity is generated and consumed you know, near simultaneously. And if we electrify heating, transportation and industry, kind of electric shortages become uh, life-threatening, uh, really bad. <clears throat> so what happens, um, on a grid. So this is New York's grid uh, in 2021. Uh, these are low carbon sources in New York stacked up on top of each other. So in the summer, uh, we have a lot of sunlight and on a good day, uh, good week, this is a one week period, hourly electricity generation. Uh, we generate a lot of solar and wind and that's great. Uh, but in a uh, winter period, when we have basically minimal or no sun, if there is no wind blowing, then your output becomes uh, very minimal. So basically there's a 10 times uh, differential between what's produced in a dark doldrums in the winter to the highest production uh, period in the summer. So if you were to build energy storage to bridge the seasonal gap, uh, that's, that would be ruinous to both society economically and uh, the environment. So I'll stop there and uh, we can come over to any other questions after. Thanks, Isaru. Uh, let me try to 
share my screen here. Um, just uh, before I share the screen, uh, my name is Eric Dawson. I'm uh, an energy analyst and a nuclear advocate with Nuclear New York coming at you from New York City. Um, since we're short on time, I'm going to jump right into this. Uh, hopefully you can see my slides. Let's see. Are we good? Yeah, OK. Um, so just to take it from there, um, we're here to talk about uh, nuclear's role in our electric grid specifically. And so if you remember nothing more uh, than this uh, coming uh, to our, our event uh, today, and I'm very happy you have, um, it's that uh, living in the 21st century world, especially in a rich modern country, requires a huge, huge, huge amount of energy, specifically electricity. Um, if you look through stages of human development, um, this uh, graph is a little esoteric, but basically um, it's pretty intuitive. If we go from a kind of stone age living, we use no electricity, of course, and very little energy uh, to begin with. And then gradually through the Neolithic um, revolution with agriculture and industrialization. And now in the 21st century with more advanced technology, we use much, much more energy on a per capita basis. Um, this comes from even caloric energy from food, but also uh, energy for cooking and heating and lighting, industry, agriculture, transportation. Um, we really, uh, on a per person basis, use so much more energy than we ever have at any time in history. And this is a good thing. <laughs> we want to keep it that way. Um, but again, to be more specific, when we're talking about development across different countries and we divide countries into uh, poor, middle, and rich, or developed and undeveloped, um, having abundant, reliable electricity on a grid is probably the best, purest metric to describe this difference. Um, this is one graph. Uh, this describes electricity consumption on a uh, kilowatt hour per capita basis. Um, it's a little esoteric, but basically, again, thinking from kind of living in a cave with basic food, water, shelter, you're using zero electricity. And then by several orders of magnitude, you get to the 21st century where we have uh, things like arthroscopic uh, surgery and uh, satellite Wi-Fi and all of these things that we take for granted and we want our kids and grandkids to have and have more of. Um, and so again, uh, thinking of uh, wealth and quality of life, standard of living, there is a high correlation, very, very strong correlation between per capita electricity use and GDP per capita and what most people consider overall quality of life. Um, you could say uh, quality of life and value in general, like beauty is an eye of the beholder, but uh, you know, a lot more people want to live in modern uh, rich countries than the opposite. Um, and uh, so this is what we really want to uh, take home. It's just the, the preeminence of electricity in a modern day uh, life. Um, and the fact that in the West, we have a growing population, we have an overall growing life expectancy, and we have a growing electrification of vehicles and buildings and heavy machinery, and all the new technology that is being pushed, whether it's desalination plants or hydrogen electrolyzers um, or uh, carbon capture and sequestration um, with the rise of cryptocurrency, all of these things require a huge amount of electricity and all of them enhance quality of life in one way or another. So we wanna keep this going. Uh, the problem that we are here to talk about, obviously for climate week, um, is that the same correlation between countries and electricity use and wealth um, also has a correlation with carbon footprint. So before we had a per capita electricity use, now we have per capita carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and so we see in general, the richest countries have the highest carbon footprint. Um, but there has been some change to that in certain countries. And so we want to know what is the best way that we can reduce our carbon footprint, but without reducing material quality of life for average people. Um, and so when we're uh, looking at this, we are, we are advocates of nuclear energy, but what we really want to inspire people to do is to look at these problems holistically and not have, not, if everybody could mute, that'd be great. Um, but uh, it, just, just to focus on um, one thing, uh, misses the forest for the trees. We should look at as many factors as possible, not just in the short term in a one year period or a 10 year period to meet some deadline, but think in the long term. 
how can we reliably, responsibly, but permanently decarbonize without launching an energy crisis like the one we're in right now, without having a, a political backlash that maybe takes us two steps back? How could we keep going forward in the long term for our kids and our grandkids? So the first factor that uh, we think is most important is reliability. There are many different uh, technical metrics of reliability and every grid is different and has positives and negatives. A every energy source has positives and negatives, frankly. Uh, nothing is perfect, there is no utopia. But in general, with geographically large, diverse grids around the world, when you include nuclear, nuclear is the most reliable by what is called capacity factor. Capacity factor measures how much an electricity source can keep generating electricity as a percentage throughout the year. Um, there are many factors that influence this, um, but nuclear is always on top in the US that has traditionally been 90% or above. And the only reason in general that is not 100% is from planned maintenance outages. So even this number is kind of a low ball. Um, but we believe that in the long term on a grid, nuclear is the most reliable individual source. It doesn't mean we need to have only nuclear, but in comparisons, nuclear wins this. But what other factors do we have? Um, again, we have the reason that we're all interested uh, today is in carbon dioxide emissions. Um, to be frank, the main difference in energy sources are you divide fossil fuels on the one hand and renewables and nuclear on the other hand. Fossil fuels have a high carbon footprint, whereas nuclear and renewables have very low. But the UN did a study last year that measured not just carbon emissions on a daily basis or a yearly basis, but in the life cycle of a plant. So if you look in the long term, if we're really getting nitty gritty, nuclear actually has a lower carbon footprint than solar and wind. Believe it or not, that is the truth. Um, and why is this? Well, it's because nuclear fission is an amazing technology that is almost as close to alchemy as we will ever get. Uh, with a very, very small amount of uranium using a small amount of material, a small amount of land, you can generate a huge amount of electricity with no air pollution and no carbon emissions, virtually none. Um, and uh, this is so, so amazing. And this is why we are so passionate about this. Um, and that concept is called energy density just uh, making energy so, so dense with such little material. Um, uh, the other thing is to look at land use. Um, and this is actually the original purpose of environmentalism in the West. If you think back to the United States in the late 19th, early 20th century, with the eventual formation of the National Park System and Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir and all of these inspirational figures, um, so much of conservation has kind of taken a backseat in recent years because there's been this tunnel vision on just carbon emissions. So we should look at carbon emissions, but we should also look at these other factors. And so we have to balance, okay, we want to use the lowest carbon, carbon emitting source, but we also want to use the source that uses the least amount of land. Guess what? Nuclear is both. Um, and all of this, by the way, comes back to electricity. It's measured on a per electricity unit generated basis because we need electricity to live our 21st century lifestyle. So that's how we compare different energy sources. Um, in terms of material, uh, the thing that pops out the uh, most right up front are, are rare earth minerals. Um, when you think of uh, solar panels and wind turbines and batteries, so much of it relies on rare earth minerals like lithium and copper and cobalt and nickel. Um, this has obviously spiked in the last year or two. Um, it's heavily reliant on uh, certain specific countries around the globe, and so they have to be mined and then transported using fossil fuels around the globe. Um, again, of course, nuclear requires uranium or in the future, uh, thorium, but um, it, it requires such a small amount per electricity unit generated. That is why it is superior in this metric compared to other zero emission sources. Um, and that's the same thing with overall material use. This is kind of a messy graph, but if you see where my cursor is, nuclear is in the middle and it is among the lowest. The only thing that beats it is hydro and hydro is a great renewable technology. It's the most reliable renewable technology, um, but it is mostly tapped out in developed countries like the US. Um, so if we're looking for something that is more scalable and that matches these factors of low material use, nuclear is the one to use. Um, the UN also did a study last year on the overall uh, ecological and health impact. Um, we are uh, very human focused, um, as are most people, but in also thinking about the impact of energy technology on plant life and wildlife, specifically on endangered species, 
again, based on the obvious factors I just went over in terms of land use and material use and carbon emissions, nuclear has the lowest overall ecological impact compared to other energy sources on a per electricity unit basis. Um, one of the other advantages to having um, so much abundant energy that is all produced domestically is it uh, provides a national security benefit and energy independence. Um, a couple years ago, this might seem very esoteric, but in the modern energy crisis that's going on right now, um, obviously so much of uh, the problems of individual uh, developed countries, especially in the West, are an over-reliance on fossil fuels from Russia and other potentially uh, volatile countries and an over-reliance on manufacturing supply chains to China. Um, if you investigate the uh, downstream supply chain or upstream supply chains rather with solar panels and wind turbines and batteries, almost all of it goes back to China. If there were some sort of a, a geopolitical conflict involving China and supply chains were shut down, this would cause all of the renewable technologies that people are attached to, the price would go up tremendously. So when we talk about cost, again, we encourage people to think in terms of the long-term. Energy price is um, uh, famously volatile. So however we can uh, make it more domestically abundant, the better in the long-term. Um, and we have to look at the impact on labor. Um, and uh, the thing that we have discovered about nuclear is compared to other utility industries, it actually has the highest median wages and highest union membership. Um, and whenever we uh, have met up with uh, union guys in New York, they're all ultra pro-nuclear and they say, well, what is going on? Why are people protesting? We've been to uh, some of these climate meetings in New York where you have these kind of, um, you know, 100% renewables uh, college kids who are just protesting against these like, you know, older union guys who say, why are you shutting down? Or why do you want to shut down the largest source of zero emission electricity that's the most scalable? Um, so this has a benefit to labor. And we've also discovered that a lot of um, nuclear plants in the US are located in these small towns that don't have a lot of other economic options that might be considered rust belt areas otherwise. Um, and uh, uh, most of these towns are ultra pro-nuclear to say the least. So they really appreciate having clean jobs in a, a place that um, uh, emits zero air pollution, zero carbon emissions, and uh, a great tax base, donates to local charity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, safety. This is the question we get a lot about nuclear. Um, we think that there is a lot of um, poor risk assessment involving nuclear for the average person looking in for the first time. This is the graph that really convinced a lot of us uh, that we should be pro-nuclear. Again, if you evaluate different energy sources on a per electricity unit basis, it is very clear that fossil fuels end up killing the greatest number of people and nuclear is on par with renewables. Um, uh, the most dangerous aspect of energy in the long term is air pollution. Air pollution kills the greatest number of people, in particular from coal. So on a very simple level, anything that displaces coal is ultimately a positive thing for carbon emissions and for human health. And natural gas has displaced coal uh, tremendously in the last 20 years and it's continuing to do so. But if we want to actually displace natural gas um, and not have more of the uh, kind of ridiculous uh, uh, Francois Truffaut inspired uh, ads from uh, Shell or uh, there's a similar one that ExxonMobil played where they said, oh, renewables and gas go together like peanut butter and jelly. You would like to not have any more ads like this. You should support nuclear. Um, and then there's the factor of scalability. Um, oh, uh, you know, sometimes we talk to people that are not familiar with energy policy, not familiar with nuclear, and they say, oh, how, how can you envision this new technology from taking off? Uh, how could this be possible? This is not a new technology. This has been supplying millions of people with zero emission electricity on a grid for decades since before I was born. And the model that we look to that is the easiest to understand is France. France gets the highest percentage of electricity from nuclear power, and they have for decades successfully. They've never had a major accident. Um, and Currently, they get something like around 90% of their electricity from zero emission sources, mostly from nuclear. And they did this in the 1970s and 80s. So they went from having a majority of their electricity from fossil fuels in the 1970s, then triggered by an international energy crisis, the OPEC embargo in the 70s, the prime minister at the time said, okay, we're going to have a big nuclear buildup. And 20 years later, they decarbonized their electric grid. They almost decarbonized their electric grid without even trying. And there's no reason that the US and other countries can't do exactly the same thing. The blueprint is right there. 
Um, and the other reason we like nuclear is because we see a tremendous uh, potential for bipartisanship. Obviously, we're in an era that is very divided in the US and many other countries, in, in, especially in the West. Um, and uh, we, we think that right now the majority of Republicans are in favor of nuclear only because they're in favor of an all of the above energy policy. Democrats are roughly split, but in the last year, it has been shifting in the pro-nuclear direction. Um, this is also the case in Europe, where nuclear was added to their EU official um, green taxonomy. Um, we had some plants saved in Democrat strong Illinois. We have a plant, uh, we had a plant saved recently, Diablo Canyon in California. Um, and so you see the more and more people become informed, then the more they admit, perhaps reluctantly, oh, I think actually we have to preserve and expand nuclear. Um, and I would say to people on all sides, um, uh, so many people couch their uh, political opinions as being against something. They're either against fossil fuels or on the other side, they're against having energy price spikes and you know government takeovers and new taxes, or they don't want sprawling you know, solar projects and wind projects. Okay, if you're against something, it's not as strong as being in favor of something. So nuclear, believe it or not, it solves all those problems I just mentioned. So we encourage people to be nuclear for many reasons, not just one. Um, and uh, we also wanted to highlight um, the recent uh, UN uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, again, it speaks to just looking at all of these um, energy policies holistically, not just focusing on one aspect of carbon emissions, but also on the aspect of supplying uh, millions of people with abundant electricity on a grid and how that impacts poverty and hunger and health and the environment. Um, and uh, so we think that, again, holistically, including all of these things, nuclear beats out fossil fuels and renewables in terms of something that can be scalable, something that can actually potentially take a majority of the electric grid. Um, this also fits with ESG investing, environmental social governance investing, again, not thinking in terms of uh, just profitability, but okay, we want to be profitable, but also have a low carbon footprint and a low land footprint, and we want good jobs and you know all of this. We think that nuclear fits this bill better than any other energy technology, but unfortunately, most ESG portfolios currently exclude nuclear. Um, we think that this is for no good reason. And uh, so we think that eventually the 100% renewable policies are going to hit a ceiling and nuclear is eventually going to take off at which point investors are going to make some money. So we would encourage anybody who's interested in ESG investing, anybody who's interested in cryptocurrency, um, investing in nuclear and promoting nuclear is ultimately going to help you. Um, and uh, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, and so I'll just say that uh, we are a very, very grassroots organization, Nuclear New York. Um, you can reach us at our website, nuclearny.org, or you can follow us on Twitter at NuclearNY. Um, we formed initially to try to stop the uh, premature shutdown of Indian Point, which was a nuclear power plant near New York City in this uh, nice little town, Buchanan, along the Hudson. Um, it supplied uh, downstate New York with the vast majority of their clean electricity. And then as uh, you know, part of their environmental policy, supposedly, they uh, shut it down prematurely. And so uh, basically, uh, New York can be viewed as uh, a tale of two grids, upstate versus downstate. People often highlight this politically or culturally, but the bottom line is that downstate now gets a majority of their electricity from fossil fuels after shutting down the last nuclear plant. Whereas in upstate New York, we have three fully functional power plants, uh, nuclear power plants on Lake Ontario, and they get 90% of their electricity from zero emission sources, from mostly nuclear and hydro. Um, so uh, with that, again, I uh, encourage you to uh, come to our website, check us out. Um, if you'd like to make a donation, we won't fight you on that. And um, I will hand it over to uh, Dietmar and maybe we'll get some questions in the chat. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Isuru and Eric. Um, beautiful slides. Uh, if anybody wants to see, uh, download the slide decks, uh, we will post them on our web page. The link is again in the chat. Um, we will also post a link to the video once it's uh, done processing, so in, uh, maybe an hour later after this seminar. Um, we had a number of questions come up um, that might be relevant to everyone here. One question was about whether the data that we use uh, from the UN Economic Commission on Europe, does that include life cycle emissions, uh, in particular on carbon? 
uh, where nuclear I have the lowest, uh, even lower than wind and solar. And yes, uh, UNECE use life cycle um, emissions. A life cycle emission calculation is very difficult. So if you want to learn more about that, uh, we also posted the link in the chat to the actual study. See, did, look at their methods, how they do that. Uh, there are in a lot of factors going into it. Uh, that's also why you can see different numbers on life cycle uh, emissions. But yes, uh, cradle to grave, um, that's what they were striving for. Um, and that came out last year, 2021, if people are looking mm -hmm. this up. One question was on the capacity factors. Uh, why is coal and gas so low in capacity factor? Um, there, um, some has to do, most has to do with market factors. Uh, we have a lot of coal capacity still on the grid, um, as gas is pushing against the demand for coal along with renewables. Those plants are still standing around, kind of suppressing um, the posted capacity factor because they're not being called on for that many hours in the year. Um, the capacity factor shows how many hours they actually run. So that can be uh, reduced due to technical issues or due to the weather in terms of, um, but with renewables or simply due to market factors where coal and gas as well is just too expensive to run at a time where it's not being asked for because uh, renewables and nuclear and hydro are uh, serving demand just fine. Uh, one question- just just to pivot off that briefly, um, uh, in addition to nuclear not requiring the degree of battery storage um, or uh, backup sources that other sources might require, um, in uh, building new nuclear, um, the question is always, oh, well, where will we build it? Well, the best place to add a new nuclear reactor is at an existing nuclear plant. And the second place to add a nuclear reactor is in a decommissioned coal plant. And that is actually exactly what's happening in Wyoming with the Natrium Project, which is partially funded by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Um, and so when you think about land use and backup, these, these issues, uh, a big issue is the, uh, re the requirement to build new transmission lines. Whenever you have these new solar parks and new wind parks in different parts of the country, you need to build new transmission lines to go from these areas to population centers. With the expansion, certainly the preservation, but also the expansion of nuclear, you're requiring fewer and fewer new transmission lines to be built. So this is less new permits that need to be get, less lawsuits, less cost, less time, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we think in the long term, nuclear is a more efficient way to decarbonize. Yeah, thank you. The uh, another question was about the cost. Why uh, do uh, nuclear restrained uh, zero carbon systems have such high costs? Meaning, in this one three dimensional chart, why do costs rise so dramatically as you're going towards zero carbon emissions in your electricity uh, system um, if you exclude nuclear? Hey, Sir, do you want to explain that in more detail? Oh, yeah. So uh, there's a few questions on cost, and I think this is super relevant uh, because, you know, you, you got to um, build an electric system that's affordable across the board, right? It's not just affordable for people who can have a battery backup Tesla Powerwall in their, in their house, but affordable to kind of the vast majority or everybody actually who uses the grid. And, and I think uh, we, we, uh, we didn't uh, cover a lot of this, uh, but we did talk about it uh, um, uh, before this meeting started, is um, the question of renewable cost um, or versus nuclear becomes very different at different levels of penetration. So uh, if you have solar and wind uh, coming online on a fossil heavy grid, the fossil can expand and contract as need be to uh, accommodate for that uh, variable generation. So at that point, uh, the solar and wind are basically fuel savers. So if you have solar panel on your roof, you don't use uh, grid electricity during the daytime. So that means the power plant down the line the, is not gonna burn fossil during that time. So at that point, um, there's a kind of savings on the, on the grid, um, but, if you, when you get to that um, high penetration, so Germany is an example where uh, you know renewable penetration has increased substantially. At that point, the system costs, the uh, things we talked about uh, in the storage, the transmission, all that stuff, maintaining all that infrastructure becomes uh, on top of providing the electricity that you use, right? So. Um, 
So storage, uh, maybe I'll touch a little bit on storage uh, alone, just to highlight how big of an impact this has. Um, so this is a study that came out in 2016 uh, that shows, uh, sorry, um, that shows the, uh, the cost of batteries. If you were to decarbonize or bring California to 80% renewable grid in California, the cost of storage to bridge between your summer peak generation in solar to, your, um, to the rest of the year, you spread that, the cost of storage is 16 times the cost of the renewable infrastructure uh, at a high, high cost uh, per kilowatt hour battery cost. And even at the projected future costs of battery in the uh, you know, hopeful scenarios, you still, the battery cost becomes three times the cost of your renewable infrastructure. So, uh, so th that's why the, uh, it's like a little hard to uh, compare, but there are studies that are being done um, even from renewable advocates in um, acknowledging that uh, if you don't have a flexible uh, carbon-free source, then you become um, extremely, you run into very extremely expensive source uh, generation systems. And just to pivot off that, a lot of this is um, the difference between uh, looking at all these factors and cost is one of them um, in terms of the uh, short term versus the long term. Um, and so we think that renewables, if you actually investigate um, subsidies uh, from the government on a uh, per electricity unit basis and you compare it to other sources, these are the most oversubsidized and they've been so for the last 10 to 20 years. Um, and so we think that this is going to reach a, a ceiling of development. So there will be a honeymoon period at which point you can't go past a, a certain mark. And that's why we support nuclear as a better long-term solution. So again, we encourage people to do their own research, um, but investigate these things, not just in terms of one factor or one technology, but holistically in the long-term. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions. Thank you very much for bringing them and uh, thank you very much for to everyone for attending and for sticking around. Uh, these are good questions. Um, we, uh, we have a very short one um, just came in about Indian Point. Uh, someone asked whether Indian Point could reopen. Um, the technical uh, window has closed on reopening the reactors that we've had there. Um, they are damaged. Uh, it's, it's practically impossible to convince NRC, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, to uh, permit these reactors again after that much damage. Um, the site, of course, is still somewhat ideal. It has transmission lines. It has a community that would welcome um, uh, nuclear development there. I guess there are people opposed to uh, nuclear power as well, but Buchanan has done very well uh, having Indian Point uh, as an employer and taxpayer in the community, and they miss it dearly. So, uh, and Holtec, the current owner of the site, um, busy with the decommissioning, they are uh, they own their own SMR project. Uh, it's a small modular reactor, 160 megawatt in size, um, that they might want to employ there. Uh, they're a little mum about their plans, and it will not happen for another 10, 20 years or so anyway, before Jews would come out, even if that is their plan. Um, so that's where we are right now. We do need a lot of clean electricity here in downstate um, and nuclear would be a very good answer and definitely price compatible or cost compatible, comparable uh, with the proposals that the state is currently um, following, like the uh, CHP bringing hydropower from Canada and other pro proposals. Um, one question was about- oh, coming Can I just add one thing? Yeah. Um, uh, I think we get this question a lot. Is it possible that Indian Point can be brought back online? There's nothing uh, technical that is preventing that. And in the long term, maybe 20 years from now, 30 years from now, this could happen. This is largely a result of um, uh, political reasons. It's like asking, oh, is it possible that Florida would secede from the US? It's like, well, no, it is not realistic that'll happen tomorrow in 100 years maybe. Um, and uh, this is why we are so enthusiastic about nuclear because um, there are so many moving parts and it relies so heavily on government regulation and on long-term investment that if you 
go on this path of decommissioning plants, it is a very slow process to reverse that. And so we would rather just continue on the path of keeping this wonderful zero emission source of electricity rather than go you know, uh, two steps forward and one step back and decommission all the plants and then try to recommission them 20 or 30 years later. Um, so maybe in the future, maybe it could happen. There's some hope. Some questions are about uh, communication, um, like what pro-nuclear activists um, could do better, maybe uh, questioning about uh, questions regarding what are the main criticisms um, against nuclear power and how best to respond to them. Uh, I think uh, we, we as activists would like to get some input as well. And I already texted uh, Rod Adams, who is a communication master. He's here in, uh, a participant, but he hasn't responded yet. Maybe he can get a jump on this question. Um, what are the main criticisms on nuclear and uh, how best to respond to them that would be probably the waste, the safety and the costs. Um, Rod, are you available to, to give us an, a few words of wisdom? Else I hand this to maybe Suru, you wanna take this? That's a different uh, webinar, but um, yes. <laughs> so there, there's a, I mean, there's a lot, and there's a lot of people doing a lot of really good stuff in um, reframing the debate, right? Um, and uh, and it is showing real impact. So um, we actually did save the nuclear plants in Illinois, which was slated for closure. We actually did save the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, which, in fact. The current governor was the one who engineered the closure. Uh, and now when the grid stability is at risk, uh, he said, oh, actually we can't shut it down. So he got the democratic uh, lawmakers to pass a bill to save it. So, uh, and across the developed world, um, so Netherlands, uh, UK, France, um, South Korea, Japan, I mean, all these countries have committed to uh, building new nuclear or restarting existing nuclear in a, in a major way. And this just happened in the last two years. Uh, so New York, I mean, uh, New York will come around, but uh, the, the, it's the people who get in front of the line will win, right? So Wyoming is building nuclear. I mean, the, the DOE just put out a, a study showing 80% uh, of the coal plants uh, in the country are suitable for a replacement with a nuclear facility replacing the coal unit. As we mentioned, the transmission lines are already there. Uh, the workforce is already there. Um, so it's and it's uh, it's a lot of work. We are doing the little things that we can to move the needle. Uh, but uh, there's a, this is a growing and very powerful movement, and is not funded by industry. We are all doing this out of own time, our own pocket. And we are, uh, uh, and we invite you to join us, uh, either with Nuclear New York or other groups that we work. Happy to kind of have your energy, your enthusiasm. Bring your questions. You don't have to be nuclear convert. Wow. We have people who are a very broad spe spectrum of political uh, affiliations, of uh, walks of life, industry, um, labor organizers, and we bring them together on a very kind of humanity first eco-protective eco, uh, uh, vision of the future. We all, I'll just add also, um, we feel that we're the best nuclear advocates right now. So how can we possibly improve? This is something that we rack our brains over, but um, we're open to whatever comments you have. Um, we are often told that um, we get too nitty gritty into technical details um, and that we should just have, you know, um, graphics of uh, atoms splitting with rainbows and unicorns and, uh, oh, we should have a music video or we should have a clever march or a bumper sticker or something. Um, I think that in the long term, if you want more and more people to actually uh, come over and actually um, uh, put their efforts behind in, in, in the long term and in the big picture, we need to encourage people to really scrutinize all the information they're getting and not get attached to these individual events or, or personalities or bumper stickers or anything like that. Um, and so that's why we try to be as transparent as possible and try to be as thorough as possible. And we encourage you all to fact check us and uh, go to all these websites, go to our website and try to fact check us, go to our world and data is a great one, go to all the data from the UN and um, 
uh, you know, all the, the various, uh, you know, climate organizations in the world and, and really try to think, okay, what will be best holistically in the long term, technically, really be um, uh, rooted in the grim reality of uh, the physical world. Thank you. Um, we have a, a few more questions um, that, that are a little bit aside from there. Uh, one question was um, in terms of costs, uh, the security costs of nuclear power plants. Um, this is has become a cost factor. Uh, this uh, security costs that have been recently added uh, after September 11, where every nuclear power plant has to uh, have like basically a little army. I think it's a staff of like 90 or so armed um, security guards. They have to be paid. Um, that, that was an additional constraint and um, here in the US only, elsewhere in the world, um, nuclear power plants do not have to uh, carry that burden. Um, the security costs were always being added and uh, it, it kind of was, was a mechanism to uh, keep the nuclear power plants around by adding piecemeal security demands, mostly in terms of safety, like technical um, mechanisms to prevent accidents from happening or from uh, having um, effects on the environment and the people around. Um, these plants, the, these costs added were uh, never too expensive uh, to cause a shutdown of those plants, which would have been politically difficult. Um, but nevertheless, they were added uh, again and again and again. And the utilities or plant operators just suffered through them, but stopped building new plants. So uh, when we're looking at uh, cost of nuclear power, it is also in par partly due uh, to these always added security measures that were not, I would say, not always being warranted. I'm happy that our plants are very safe, but we have to weigh that against um, the, the loss of new nuclear capacity being built. Instead, we were burning coal and gas. Uh, and, and killing many, many more people than possibly by uh, a nuclear accident that we might have prevented by these additional technologies um, uh, would have happened. So uh, the, the security, um, the added security uh, be became like a millstone around the neck of the nuclear industry. Uh, and with every innovation step that the nuclear developers Broad to make plants cheaper. Um, it, it was never enough. Always something new was being added and the plants got more complex. So I think this is a very important question. Uh, it is difficult to raise in public that in order to have a nuclear revolution, we would have to have the plants be less safe. Um, but yeah, definitely a communication challenge here and difficult. Thanks for the question. Um, just to pivot off that um, with the security, it, it, again, we just uh, encourage people to think holistically in the long term. And so security is an issue and there are many things that we can do to mitigate those risks. Um, but uh, even if you think of something as terrible as the 9-11 tragedy, you know, you could have this absurd logic and say, oh, uh, well, since that happened, therefore we shouldn't allow planes um, to fly anymore, or we shouldn't allow tall buildings to be built. Um, but overall society benefits from having planes and tall buildings. Overall society benefits from having nuclear plants. Um, and this is why even in a post Fukushima Japan, uh, most Japanese people are still pro-nuclear. If you look in Ukraine right now, what's happening, some of the plants are being uh, targeted to some degree. There's no great anti-nuclear energy movement in Ukraine right now. Overall, they have actually benefited, believe it or not, from having zero emission electricity on a grid. Um, and so, uh, again, you know, these are factors, but uh, and, and we're happy to acknowledge them. But we need to think in a long term. And I think uh, just on the Ukraine uh, story, I mean, this is an evolving story and obviously needs to uh, be taken into consideration. Right? We are not we are not industry people. We're not hiding anything, but. Um, one thing to uh, note is uh, in the EU's uh, sustainable uh, energy taxonomy. So this is a taxonomy that was developed by the European Union to assist in uh, investment choices to choose which uh, energy sources are 
or activities are um, sustainable. So uh, the science um, part, the, the scientific research committee uh, said that, um, let me quote exactly, because this is really critical. Um, and I'll show you. So this is what the um, highest scientific body of the European Commission after years of study said, there is no science-based evidence that nuclear energy does more harm to human health or to the environment than other climate change mitigation technologies. So this was the science. So this came out maybe a year or two ago. Uh, and then uh, Germany and some anti-nuclear uh, governments waged war against uh, established uh, research and try to exclude nuclear from the uh, EU's uh, sustainable classification. Uh, and Ukraine and France and uh, Czech Republic and Poland and lots of other countries joined and opposed Germany in trying to exclude nuclear. So Ukraine, which suffered from Chernobyl, the only nuclear accident in 70 years of nuclear uh, energy generation that uh, it has a recorded um, actually uh, of deaths. Um, and so that country is advocating the EU to include nuclear in the sustainable generation technology uh, at least. So that should show you a little about the people who have suffered the most. And so Fukushima, we talked about Japan, um, they are recommitting to building nuclear, uh, bringing all their plants back online. I mean, the energy crisis, is, a, is real, is wrecking havoc across Europe. And so the overall benefit of having that energy on the grid is much more beneficial than to say, no, no nuclear will do it all solar and wind. Yeah, I'll just say um, in the, we're in kind of the natural gas era. And the fact is that uh, Russia has the highest natural gas reserves of any country in the world. So if Europe uh, would have been less reliant on natural gas, if every country in Europe would have followed France, France's example, um, you know, I, I think it's uh, less likely that this would have happened to begin with. Uh, energy independence, but like I say, uh, foreign policy in many ways is energy policy. It's the same. If you have domestic energy independence, then you are less reliant on these other volatile countries. Okay. Um, well, it's about one o'clock now. Uh, that's the end of our official time. Uh, I think we can, uh, at this time, maybe open it up uh, for those who want to stick around to, to more interactive uh, and, and voice your questions directly into the group here, turn on your video, turn on your mic, um, and we, we can just hang around a little bit more uh, as, as if we go over to the cocktail party uh, of, of this seminar. Um, thank you everyone else who has to leave to attend another of the great events of Climate Week, New York City, um, and, uh, and enjoy this great week of good events. Uh, it seems like we were the only uh, host of a nuclear themed event this Climate Week. We do hope that next Climate Week, uh, nuclear energy uh, is going to play more of a role as we expect uh, in, in Climate Week, as we expect nuclear energy to play more of a role in the future of our energy transition to hit that target, zero carbon, as soon as possible. <laughs>